Today I am sharing with you a kind of sermon. It is one to provoke thought and So you can go after the Congregational Cafe and have roast preacher for lunch. I'm preaching more recent scholarly research. This is not my theology per se. So it's things for you to consider and talk about. How many of you in the last years or so have read The Da Vinci Code? Dan Brown's. And how many have seen the movie? Any of you? It's a fun story, of course. But, um, why should a comparatively light adventure story have such interest? It's not a complex weaving menace with history and secret society an art of course. Previous novels and demons, who read that one? Did you read it first or second? Second. Yeah, it was written first, but the Da Vinci Code got it. It had all things and even the same hero, but it sold in the low thousands in its first publishing. What the code has that its predecessor lacked were a supposed secret from the foundations of Christianity. It said the church tried to destroy and a complex series of people and organizations that preserved it for various reasons. It preserved those secrets. And it is not a tale that Brown invented himself. The story is fascinating, full of hypotheses, myths, and lies. If you haven't read it, now you're going to want to. And at times it explains some of the mysterious Western history. It embraces some of the most famous personages in a game of power and deception. There is no way we can do justice or even to a small part of it in the brief time that we have here. Of course, the Da Vinci Code is a work of fiction. That is true. And it has a characters and events. But it also includes some misstatements, exaggerations, and hypotheses presented as fact. Arthur Brown did not invent the secret of the Da Vinci Code. In fact, a very old and not so secret. We'll talk about some of that today. Despite the supposed view of Jesus' life and teaching, teaching Testament, the record from clear there were major major agreements in the early church. There are three major groups of Christians after Jesus into heaven. And this is important for you to know. Led to believe there was only one group of cohesive people that believed in Jesus as Christ. But that's not true. After Jesus left earth, however that happened, there were three major groups. One, converted Jews and followed Peter. Okay, this is now. Two, those who were Gentiles, not Jews, converted and followed Paul. Mm -hmm. And three, those who became known as the Gnostics. And when I was in college, them the Gnostics. Okay. Those three groups disagreed about a number of things, very specific things about the faith and how to best live out their faith. Disagreement they were about fundamental things as like the nature of God and Jesus 
and the whole world and crucifixion and the resurrection and salvation and the kingdom of heaven and Jewish scripture and how to practice the faith. I mean, some significant things, right? And we can see hints of these divisions in the New Testament epistles, things like Corinthians, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, those books of the Bible. Can you think of any of these? Well, history, as you know, is written by victors. So works that were deemed heretical were destroyed or simply not preserved, except for isolated fragments. And so scholars had little material to show what the losers in those early doctrinal wars had really thought. So it was the first crusade that was undertaken for the sole purpose of destroying a vibrant community of Gnostics in the south of France. And after that, Gnosticism, that third group of followers, went without much notice until 1945. All those years later, in December of 1945, Field hands in Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt found a burial that contained 46 Gnostic writings sealed in a jar sometime in the 400s. So from 400 all the way to 1945, these writings were in the jar and left in Egypt. After a series of most of the material survived to become available for study. Now we know a lot about those Gnostic believers. And I've listed this in the contemporary word for you so you can follow along what those nasty Gnostics that followed after Jesus believed. So they believed that the God of the Old Testament is an inferior legalistic bumbling God who produced an inferior bumbled creation. Ha! <laughs> That's us! The human body is from this God, but the human spirit, spirit is from an ultimate wonderful God who sent Jesus to show us the way to free ourselves from this sorry world and return to a higher God. Does that make sense? You may not believe it, but does it make sense? Okay. And they believed that the crucifixion was in some manner a sham. The resurrection either did not occur or it's irrelevant. They also believed that the kingdom of heaven is available now, or at least it was when they were alive, okay? Within each person, and hidden all around us, and it's not some entity that's going to appear on earth after some apocalyptic event. So the kingdom of heaven is available now. And then salvation is to be achieved through true knowledge, which means Gnostic knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this knowledge is secret, as in something we tell each other, but it's secret right, or esoteric and must be individually attained. There is no authoritative doctrine or creed. So the way we get this knowledge is to tell each other quietly. And that's the knowledge, the Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, by the way, even in 0 to 400, was an inclusive religion it, intol it tolerated different religious beliefs, and it did not discriminate against women or other people, um, various racial groups, other religious groups, or various people. So now let's get to the juicy part. Are you ready? So let's talk about the Gnostic rumors about Mary Magdalene. How many of you have heard that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute?
who repented and followed Jesus. Oh yeah, most of us have heard that rumor. The story is very inspiring. She was a, a reformed sinner. She was a humble person. She was given the role of telling Jesus followers about his resurrection. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, for one thing, the Gospels don't support it. Not there. Great rumor, great story, juicy, delightful, not there. Pope Gregory I in the 500s declared that Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, and the unnamed repentant prostitute mentioned in the New Testament were all the same individual, and that is the view that is widely held today. But it just isn't so. There are three different people in the Bible. Some even add the unnamed woman taken in adultery to the mix so that all those women are added together as one woman in the Bible. However, even the Catholic Church, as of 1969, admits that the Pope was wrong on this issue. Okay, another thing. The Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene are the only women that are mentioned in every single gospel. In all but one of the enumerations of the women with Jesus, Mary Magdalene is listed first, appearing before even yet another Mary, the mother, in two apostles, and Joanna, the wife of King Herod Stuart. Luke states that Mary Magdalene and the others, and I quote, ministered to Jesus of their substance. That is, they funded Jesus' ministry. Mary Magdalene as, was an independent woman of status and means. Pretty cool. Mary Magdalene funded Jesus' ministry. In the Gospel of Mary, which is not a canonized book. It didn't make the Gospels that are in our Bible. After Jesus' final departure, Mary Magdalene is portrayed as rallying all the dispirited male apostles and sending them forth to preach the good news. Are you excited about this? This is very exciting. Mary Magdalene was the one who got the 12 apostles to get going. She's the one that got them together and said, come on, guys, let's go. Get out there and tell the other people about Jesus. And in a Gnostic document entitled Pistis Sophia that was found in Egypt, but not at Nag Hammadi, Jesus is asked a series of 46 questions. Mary Magdalene is the one who asks 39 of those questions, and Jesus describes her as being more devoted to heaven's kingdom than all of the male disciples. Now the next question. This is tantalizing. Could Jesus have been married? How many say yes? How many say no? Whoa, the yeses have it. Did the choir vote? Okay. <laughs> it was the usual practice for adult male Jews to be married. And the production of children, of course, was an obsessive preoccupation in the early Jewish scriptures. However, if Jesus had erroneously believed, like the Essenes, that the end of the world was about to occur, he, like the Essenes, would probably have been celibate. But if he had been married, no mention of it would have been in the scripture, right? Because it would have been normal. But at the marriage in Cana, Jesus does not object to the event, and he performs his first 
recorded miracle to facilitate the proceedings. Also in the gospel, Jesus is frequently called rabbi or teacher, but Jewish law said, and I quote, an unmarried man may not be called teacher. Now let's go back to the Cana wedding. It's a puzzle, that whole story. As presented, an itinerant preacher early in his career and others associated with him are guests at this wedding. The wine has run out. You remember this story, right? Suddenly, this preacher's mother and then the preacher start giving orders, even though they're just guests at the wedding. And the servants of the household snap and start immediately obeying Jesus and his mother despite their strangeness, and the wine is produced from water. But why was Mary so concerned about the state of the party? Why would Jesus have any responsibility to bail out the host? Why were the servants so ready to run about and do strange things for these guests at the wedding. Unless Jesus was the groom and Mary was the mother of the groom and they were hosting the party. Hmm. 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 Something to think about. Now, let's get to the really fun parts found in the Gospels of Philip and Mary, Gnostic Gospels. These are our traditional words for today, and they're printed in your bulletin if you want to take them home and ponder. Again, these are Gospels that are not in our biblical canon, but were written at the same time as the Gospels that are in the Bible. From the Gospel of Mary, Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the teacher loved you differently from other women. Tell us whatever of any words he told you which we have not yet heard. At this, Levi spoke up. Peter, you have always been hot-tempered, and now we see you repudiating a woman just as our adversaries do. Yet, if the teacher held her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the teacher knew her very well, for he loved her more than us. In the Gospel of Philip, Mary Magdalene is described as Jesus' companion or partner or consort with all that that implies. And the Coptic language, the Egyptian language here, can be used to translate equally well into any of these. And so for, from the Gospel of Philip, these three Marys walked with the Lord, his mother, his sister, and Mary of Magdala, his companion. His sister and mother and companion were Mary. And finally, the most interesting of all, the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. The Savior loved her more than any of the disciples, and he kissed her often on her mouth. The other disciples said to him, Why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered, saying to them, Why do not I love you like her? So we have an interesting possibility that can't be ruled out, that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, and perhaps that together they produced a child. Gnostic Christians, a couple of hundred years after Jesus' death, appear to have believed in this marriage. It is, of course, far from proven. I think that even the modern group purporting to be the priori, priori of Zion does come forward with its supposed hidden evidence. The matter was still not definitively resolved. So, that's the information. 
I'm not espousing an answer. I'm just giving you the information. Now let's talk about Judas and his gospel. The manuscript we have of Judas's gospel did not come to us in pristine condition, and it's not the oldest form of the text. In fact, it's translated from the original into Coptic. It's spent about 16 centuries in the desert of Egypt as a leather-bound papyrus manuscript. So the papyri on which the gospel is written is now in over a thousand pieces with many sections that are missing. And the codex originally contained 31 pages with writing on the front and the back sides. But when it came to market in 1999, only 13 of those pages remained. Other ancient writings refer to the Gospel of Judas. Irenaeus and Origen referred to it in their writings in approximately 180 and 230 CE, respectively. And the Gospel of Judas offers an alternative portrait of the disciple who the four Gospels in the Bible say betrayed Jesus. In this account, Judas receives secret knowledge uh, from Jesus and is chosen by Jesus to carry out the betrayal. And that allows Jesus to escape from his mortal body and return to God. Now, before you dismiss this as clearly false, let me ask you, how often have you been at an event and had a discussion and then later heard about it from another person who was at the same event but heard the story differently? This was happening in biblical times too. And it was compounded by the problem that most of the society was not literate. So there were no office memos, and there were no copy machines, and no postal service. And information was not passed around on paper, it was passed orally. So is it possible that Judas came away from, from a conversation with Jesus that the others didn't know about? Is it possible that Judas, a follower of Jesus, wasn't greedy, but thought he was doing his friend a favor? That's what the Gospel of Judas is all about. And I have a few copies if you'd like to read it for yourself. So these are some intriguing questions that are raised by the Gnostic Gospels, and there's enough evidence to argue both sides. Some Christians see these Gnostic questions as an affront to their faith. I get that. That's why the early church decided Gnosticism was wrong and evil and nasty. And it was the Gnostics that we can thank for the early church feeling so threatened that they decided to get their act together and write down their stories and add to their numbers. Because of the threat that the Gnostics posed, the early church, as we know it, grew and prospered. If the Gnostics had not threatened them, they wouldn't have gotten to, together and done what they did and prospered as we know it. It occurs to me that we have the same choice. Will we allow the people outside who are nasty threaten us and undermine us? Do we feel threatened by questions raised in stories like the Da Vinci Code and does it change what we believe at all? 
Or will we respond by writing our own stories, bringing more people into the church to ask questions, and then share our faith? Instead of being threatened, will we come together and respond by including and sharing our faith together?